Hi friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor here. We want to invite you back to our study on the Great Tribulation, more specifically, shocking truths about the Great Tribulation. Now, if you remember from presentation number one, we talked about how the Great Tribulation, people typically think about this great time of trouble at the end of time, and that is true, and that'll be our next presentation. But when Jesus in Matthew 24 talks about a Great Tribulation, he's really talking about three events what we talked about last time, the fall of Jerusalem and a great tribulation that would come upon the Jewish nation when the temple was destroyed by the Romans and the Jewish people were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. But then there's another, a second great tribulation many people forget about. Jesus foretells there is a great tribulation that will come on the church historically over the span of history between the first coming and the second coming. That's our subject today. And in our final presentation, we will be talking about the great, great tribulation that comes at the end of time that is synonymous with the seven last plagues. So let's back up a little bit and let's read some of the verses that are the foundation for what we're talking about. You read in Matthew chapter 24, and let me get this here for you, in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those that are in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, this is sort of a dual prophecy. First of all, he was telling the Jewish nation that when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the Roman army, they would come in and desolate the temple. And we know this because Luke says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. That was the first part of this. But the abomination of desolation was really twofold. First, you've got the Roman power led by Caesars that desolated the Jewish temple and God's literal Israel. Then you have a Roman power led by popes that desolated God's people, spiritual Israel, through history. That's going to be our study for this presentation. Now, just to give you a little history, there ended up being a great persecution that took place when the Jews were scattered, when Jerusalem was destroyed. The devil tried to destroy the church just from the outside. Christians were killed in the Colosseums and fed to the lions and, and different emperors like Nero and Diocletian and Caligula persecuted the church. But the more they persecuted the church, the more it grew. So the devil went to plan B. If you cannot destroy the church from the outside, do it from the inside. Along came an emperor by the name of Constantine, also known as Constantine the Great. He was fighting battles and trying to win the supreme authority of Rome. He thought, here we're fighting the Christians. They're really not hurting anybody. His mother, Catherine, converted to Christianity. And so he basically legalized Christianity. He claimed that he saw a sign of the cross in the heavens before he had this battle at Maximilian Bridge. And he said, now we must conquer under the sign of the cross. He even ordered his army to march through the Tiber River in Rome and said, you're all now baptized. Well, that caused a real problem. You had all of these Roman pagan soldiers that worshiped all the Greco-Roman gods. They marched through the Tiber River and they went in dry pagans and they came up wet pagans, but now they're being told they're Christians. And suddenly you saw something happen to the church that was just really tragic. You have the amalgamation now of Christianity and the Greek and Roman religions. A great compromise came with the great Constantine. Rome was filled of idols of Jupiter and Mercury and Diana and Venus. And they said, what do we do with our statues? Well, some of the Christians said, idolatry is forbidden. You have to destroy them. So, oh, no, we can't do that. We'll win more pagans if we just rename them with Christian names. Let's just call them Peter, James, John, and Mary. And all of a sudden, almost overnight, idolatry came into the Christian church. Now, many Christians resisted these things. And there was a period of about 200 years where there was a great shaking from the time of Constantine until the time of Justinian. But just to give you an idea of some of the things that came into the church during that time, by about 500 AD, the church had become a government institution and uh, there had been a lot of compromise of religion. Bible Christians had real problems with it. Protestants did not begin with Martin Luther or John Huss. Protestants started as far back as 300, 400 AD, protesting compromise in the Christian church. Here are 10 high points that the Christians, Bible Christians, were protesting against what the church was doing during this time. 
One, the Bible teaches that we're not to bow down to statues. But the Church of Rome, and subsequently the Roman Catholic Church, said you can bow down to statues. The Bible teaches that all have sinned except Jesus. Well, the Roman Church began to teach that Mary was sinless, and they began to deify Mary. The Bible says that Jesus is the only mediator between man and God, 1 Timothy 2.5. Well, the Roman Church began to say Mary is a co-mediator with Christ. The Bible teaches that Christ offered his sacrifice on the cross once for all. Well, the Roman Church began to teach that the priest offers Christ on the altar every time he celebrates the Mass. The Bible teaches that all Christians are to be saints and priests. Well, the Catholic Church was teaching that the saints and the priests are a special caste within the Christian community and dead believers were to be worshipped as saints. We're not to do that. Number six, the Bible teaches that all Christians should know that they have eternal life. 1 John 5, 13. The Roman church was teaching that all Christians cannot and should not know that they have eternal life. Point seven, the Bible teaches that we should call no religious leader father. Well, of course, the Roman church teaches you should call the priest and the pope father. Point number eight, the Bible teaches not to pray in vain repetition. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse seven, the Roman church was teaching that if you wanted forgiveness, you confess your sins to the priest and you repeat our Father or the Hail Mary a number of times. And the Bible said that was not to be done. And point nine, which we just touched on, the Bible teaches to confess your sins to God for only God can forgive sin. Isaiah 43, 25, Luke 5, 24. The Roman Catholic Church says you must confess your sins to the priest for forgiveness. And point number 10, and this is not everything, but these are the 10 primary points. The Bible teaches before baptism, a person should be taught the gospel, repent of their sins, and obey the commandments of God, believe and repent. And that's Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Acts 8, 37. The Roman church teaches little infants must be baptized, and if they should die before, they'd be consigned to hell. The teachings of purgatory, limbo, prayers for the dead are nowhere in scripture, but they are relics of paganism. And this is what Jesus was talking about when he said even to the leaders in his day, you have a fine way of making void the word of God to observe your tradition. You put away the commandments of God that you might observe your tradition. Well, when the church stood up, along came an emperor by the name of Justinian. And he thought, we're gonna settle this once for all. Christianity was now the official religion and the organized church that had made all these compromises in Rome later known as the Roman Catholic Church, in 538, there was a great change that took place. Justinian, the Roman emperor, he moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople, and he made the Bishop of Rome the supreme leader of the church, and basically gave him an army for the purpose of correcting heretics. Now the date is 538. At this point, there was a great tribulation that came upon the church. Christians basically had to go underground for a long time, where the Church of Rome, the visible church, was a church of great compromise with um, paganism. Uh, let me just read some of this. The dragon had given to the beast his power, seat, and great authority. It, basically, the dragon of the Roman power led by Caesars gave their office in Rome to the church. That's why you read in Revelation chapter 17, it says, the woman that you saw is that city that rules over the kings of the earth that sits among seven hills, a woman among seven hills, describing what happened to the church. She had become unfaithful and became a persecuting power. There's a great time of trouble that came upon God's people. The Justinian Code, which was put into effect 538, placed the Pope as the formal head of Christendom, ordered all Christian groups to submit to his authority and gave him civil power of life and death over heretics. The Pope was given an army and Bible Christians had to flee into the wilderness. Does that sound familiar? That's what basically happened during this time period under Justinian. You can read in Revelation 12, verse six, the woman, a woman in Bible prophecy is a church, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there. Now this time period is going to come up several times for 1,260 days. So this time of the great papal persecution, it stretches for 1,260 days, but a day in prophecy is a year. There are about four different verses that tell us that in the Bible, that when you're studying time prophecies, you apply a day for a year. They just won't pan out. It doesn't make sense any other way. 
from 538, if you go to 1798, you've got 1,260 years of uninterrupted power where the Roman church was ruling over the divisions of Rome. You've got those 10 heads on the beasts. You read of Revelation, the 10 toes in the image from Daniel chapter 2. For 1,260 years, you ever play chess? By the king and the queen, there's a bishop on both sides. They were controlling the states of Europe, which was the, uh, the bastion of Christianity there during that time. And the true Christians kind of had to flee into the wilderness. So it goes on to say, for by the edict, he, Emperor Justinian, issued to unite all men in one faith, whether Jews, Gentiles, or Christians, such as did not, in the term of three months, embrace the professed Catholic faith, they were declared infamous, and as such excluded from all employments, both civil and military, rendered incapable of leaving anything by will of their estates. It was confiscated, whether real or personal. Many, however, withstood them, and against such as did the imperial edict was executed with the utmost rigor. Great numbers of true Bible Christians were driven from their habitations with their wives and their children, stripped and naked. Others inhumanely massacred by the Catholic peasants or the so soldiery who guarded the passes. That's from the history of the rise of the spirit of rationalism in Europe. You can read from the British historian Sir uh, William Edward Leakey, that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. Uh, has anyone out there ever been to Europe and you've toured the dungeons under the church? Karen and I were in Spain and you can give them a few pesos and they'll take you and they'll show you the torture implements from the great inquisition that happened in Spain and Portugal around Europe and even came to the Americas where if you did not go along with what the church said, there was a great persecution during that time. The true church had to go underground. Now, what was the time period? 1,260 days. Look at, it not only says this in uh, Revelation 12, verse 6. Let me read that again. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there. She's being fed 1,260 days. You remember Elijah fled into the wilderness during a famine for three and a half years. A Jewish year is 360 days. It's a lunar calendar. It has 42 months in three and a half years. The only way you get that is it's a 30 day month. And so here you've got 1,260 days where there's a spiritual famine in Europe, the same way Elijah was persecuted and driven into the wilderness and God fed him there. The church was driven into the wilderness during this time and God prepared a place. A lot of the true Christians fled into a mountain fortress. You realize that stretching from France through northern Italy, Switzerland, you get the Pyrenees, all the way to uh, Slovenia in the southern part of Germany, there's this bastion of mountains called the Alps. And during this time of great persecution, true Christians fled into the mountains like the Waldenses. In fact, Pope Francis recently issued an apology to the Waldenses for their, uh, the way the Catholic Church persecuted them, and the Waldenses did not accept it. I don't know, you can look that up and see it for yourself. But you get the Albigenses, the Hussites, and true Christians were driven into the hills, and God fed them there with the Word of God. This time period is not only in uh, Revelation. Look in Daniel chapter 8, verse 12 tells about the beast power that would cast the truth to the ground. They turned away from the scriptures and combined with paganism. It's what ancient Israel did, mixed Christianity or mixed the religion of Jehovah with paganism. How long would this happen? Look in Daniel 12, verse 7. It shall be for a time, a times, so that meant a couple or a pair, so that's two, and the dividing or half, that's three and a half years. So for three and a half years, you'd have this persecution. Look in Revelation chapter 12, verse seven. Same thing. It shall be for a time, a times and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, or they'll be scattered and dispersed everywhere. Look in Revelation 11, verse two and three. And they, the two witnesses of the word of God. That's the law and the prophets. Some people say it's Moses and Elijah, but Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets, the word of God went underground. They will tread down the holy city underfoot for 42 months. How long is 42 months? It's 1,260 days, three and a half years. Same period of time. It's a time of persecution and resistance. How long did Jesus teach? 
three and a half years. See, three and a half is half of seven. God's perfect number cut in half. And so it represents a time of persecution, tribulation, resistance. Jesus, of course, was executed at the end of that three and a half year period of teaching. And you've got this three and a half year period in history, a prophetic time. So we found the starting point. By the way, let me also read for you Revelation 12, verse 13 through 16. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. This is God's true church who gave birth to the man child, to Christ. But the woman was given two wings of an eagle. Eagles fly up high into the mountains that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Daniel talks about that the end of Jerusalem would be with a flood. A flood of armies came to, to persecute uh, Jerusalem and now the church sent a flood against God's people that they might be carried away. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Whenever they tried to come into the mountain fortress of the Alps, the people were protected by the passes and the hills up there. So you've got this time period that starts in 538. If you go 1,260 years, that's three and a half prophetic years, from 538, it reaches to 1798. What happened there? Well, very interesting. It's called the French Revolution. And Napoleon took charge of Europe and Rome. He sent his emperor, Berthier, into Rome in 1798. He took the Pope captive, or he died in captivity, ending the political leadership of the Catholic Church over Europe. And here's what it says here. The French Revolution, which soon led to the capture and exile of the Pope by Berthier in 1798, the religious-centric Justinian Code that had lasted for 1,260 years, was replaced by a secular Napoleonic Code. General Berthier declared Rome to be an independent republic. In consequence, every other temporal authority emanating from the old government of the Pope is suppressed and it shall no more exercise any function. That's from the Constitution of the Roman Republic. And so this is exactly what happened. There was this great persecution. They believe that somewhere between 30 and 50 million Christians and Jews were killed during this time of great persecution in history. So, something else interesting, and I'll conclude with this, that marks the end of that period. Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, talking about the historic tribulation of the church, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, powers of heaven will be shaken. In Luke, Jesus puts it this way, Luke 21, verse 11, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famine and pestilence, and there'll be fearful signs in the heavens. Well, you know, I think it's interesting that historically, right after this age of great persecution, you had what they called the Great Lisbon Earthquake. There was a great earthquake, and that was in 1755. By the way, the Lisbon earthquake is considered one of the most deadly earthquakes in history. 50,000 people up to, they believe, perished in that earthquake. And it was felt from hundreds of miles from North Africa up through Europe. And then you've got the mysterious dark day that occurred May 19, 1780. Even though it was a beautiful day, cloudless day, all of a sudden, later in the morning, the sky just began to get darker and darker and darker until they could not see without candlelight in the middle of the day. Historians cannot identify any forest fires, volcanoes, eclipse, meteor, anything that would have blocked out the sun. But across the eastern seaboard, people thought this is the day of the Lord. And when the moon came up that night, it was as red as blood. So you've got a great earthquake, you've got a great dark day in history, and then you had the stars falling from heaven. They had the great star shower of November 13, 1833. It's been the most uh, impressive, according to history, they had no photographs of it. Most impressive uh, shower display, it looked like the whole heavens were, were falling out of the sky uh, for uh, many hours, most of the night. It was that great meteor shower, and they call it the night the stars fell. And so it's interesting, you read in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, speaking of following the great persecution, the saints of God under the altar saying, how long our blood has been shed. Then it says right after that, 
Revelation 6, 12, I looked and he opened the sixth seal. Behold, there was a great earthquake, like the Lisbon earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The moon became like blood and the stars fell from heaven. So these things will happen again in quick succession at the second coming, following the great, great tribulation. But you also see a great tribulation that was prophesied in history. And all these things have happened. So phase one, great tribulation, the fall of Jerusalem, the persecution of the Jews scattered around the world. Phase two of the Great Tribulation is what happened historically during this great papal persecution that took place from 538 to 1798. Now we're moving into what is in future, the great, great persecution, the great, great tribulation of the last days, the seven last plagues. We're going to talk about that in our next presentation. Friends, if you are blessed by these studies, I hope you'll click the like, you'll share this with your friends. In doing that, you actually help share the gospel. So, so please click there and stay tuned for our next study.